Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to our performance this evening. My name is Eva Mondragon, and this is my collaborator on the piano, Adam Whiting. And we are very excited to present to you tonight some exotic works featuring the viola and piano. The first piece on our program is the Rachmaninoff Vocalise. The Vocalise is the last movement in a larger song cycle written for voice and piano that was completed in 1914. In the original work for voice, there are no words. Rather, it is sung with the vowel, ah, which um, imparts a haunting beauty and a lamenting quality to the song. The piece is a true representation of Rachmaninoff and his Russian nationalistic style of composing. It doesn't feature Russian music directly, but instead features a lyricism that displays his nationality, particularly in the great, seemingly endless, arcing melodies. The use of vocal lines in this piece is reminiscent of the liturgical music and plain chant which he was exposed to as a child and later on as an adult visiting the Russian monasteries. In fact, we can find the infamous Dies Irae, or Day of Wrath, hymn strategically interwoven into the melody of the vocalise, which certainly sets a somber tone for the work. Please enjoy Rachmaninoff's vocalise. Thank you. 
The next piece on our program will be the Suite for Viola and Piano by Ernest Bloch. Written in 1919, the Suite was the first place winner in a chamber music competition sponsored by Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. Bloch actually won $1,000 in that one. <laughs> the work was well received and is now a staple of viola literature. Even though the piece has traditional Italian titles, it is in fact very programmatic, meaning it tells a story or depicts imagery. In this case, his impression of the Far East. I'll let Bloch explain himself. It is rather a vision of the Far East that inspired me. Java, Sumatra, Borneo, those wonderful countries I so often dreamed of, though I was never fortunate enough to visit them in any other way than through my imagination. He planned on giving each movement a distinct title, but opted for the traditional ones instead, preferring, quote, to leave the imagination of the hearer completely unfettered rather than to tie him up to a definite program. The Javanese and Eastern inspiration was provided by his friend, Robert Godet, who influenced Bloch's imagination and left a deep musical impression. We hear elements of this exoticism throughout the piece. In the first movement, which is uh, originally titled In the Jungle, uh, Bloch provides us with a wonderful description. The first movement, the most complicated in inspiration and form, aims to give the impression of a very wild and primitive nature. Please enjoy the first movement of Bloch's suite for viola and piano.
Next, we come to the second movement of the piece. Um, the original Italian uh, title for this movement is Allegro Ironico, or Ironic. <laughs> um, Bloch's original title was Grotesques. Bloch writes, it is a curious mix of grotesque and fantastic characters, of sardonic and mysterious moods. Are these men, animals, or grinning shadows? And what kind of sorrowful and bitter parody of humanity is dancing before us? Sometimes giggling, sometimes serious? Thank you. 
Next, we come to the third movement of the work. Originally titled Nocturnes, this movement most clearly animates Godet's story of Java's to Block. It expresses the mystery of tropical nights. Block explains, I remembered the wonderful account of a dear friend who lived once in Java, his travels during the night, their arrival in small villages in the darkness. The distant sounds of curious, soft, wooden instruments with strange rhythms. Dances, too. Many years have passed since my friend told me all this, but the beauty and vividness of his impressions I could never forget. They haunted me, and almost subconsciously, I had to express them in music.
finally, we come to the last movement of the work. Originally titled Land of the Sun, Block writes that this last movement is probably the most cheerful thing he ever wrote, built on motives from other movements treated in a broad sense and passionate mood.
The final piece on our program tonight will be a work for solo viola. It is titled Up, Down, Sideways, Round, and it is composed by violist and teacher Garth Knox. This piece explores modern techniques for violists, specifically extended bow techniques beyond what we would normally see in classical music. Regular bow techniques, like a vertical drop similar to spiccato, is used, as well as colegno, which means to play with the wood of the bow, as well as getato, which means to throw the bow on the string and let it bounce. I will demonstrate these for you. Here is the vertical bounce. Colegno means with the stick of the bow. Jatato to throw the bow and just let it bounce as, as it does. Mr. Knox also instructs the violist to play behind the bridge, as well as doing other interesting bow strokes like the pan pipe effect, which takes the vertical stroke with some sideways movement close to the bridge creating a sound similar to the wind noise attack of the panpipes, and that sounds like this. Another creative and interesting bow stroke we find in this work is one called spazzolato, which I think might be made up. <laughs> Um, but it seems like an, a pretty appropriate name because it feels like my bow arm is spazzing out when I'm playing it. What we do in this bow stroke is that we move the bow along the length of the string this way. It gives sort of a wiping sound with very little pitch. And the last fun bow stroke we have in this piece is a circular bow stroke, which combines the spazzolato stroke with a sideways pull, similar to normal bowing. And this creates a circular motion to the bow and produces small accents that sound like a helicopter. Don't tell my teacher I bow like that. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm instructed to, so it's all good. And I hope you enjoy the final piece of the program. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great evening.
Thank you.